Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel with Right Side Blonde. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Today I'd like to bring you the August 1997 issue with Harrison Ford on the cover dressed as Abraham Lincoln. Tony Blankley is one of my favorite George contributors. Unfortunately he has passed away but his words live on in these George magazines and this article seems to be written perfectly for what's happening today. So let's read his article. Conservatives, start your engines. The Republican Revolution has stalled thanks to Bill Clinton's smooth moves and Newt Gingrich's recent reticence. How can the GOP get moving? By realizing that history is on its side. I am a patient sort of bloke. A pot of tea, a glass of whiskey, the remembrance of a cigarette well smoked. Any one of these might put me to ease and permit me to pass the stirrings of anger or concernment aroused by a glance at the contemporary scene. But even so, I am beginning to get fidgety. The past 30 years have seen a welcome and worldwide conservative ascendancy. At the moment, however, this conservative tide risks being rolled back by a shrewdly detoxified liberalism. We see this trend in France, Britain, Russia, and lamentably right here in Washington, D.C. The Republican Revolution of 1994 is in need of a second act. The public is hanging around in the lobby, working on its third $5 glass of cheap white wine served by Bill Clinton waiting for the curtain to rise for the play to continue. Because the Republicans have a historic role to complete. Our Republican Revolution, after all, didn't descend from Mars on Election Day 1994. Rather, it was an important expression of a new age in Western history. But this context has been lost in the rush of reporting day-to-day -day Washington events without connecting them to history's great flow. In literature, for example, what distinguishes pornography from the classic romance isn't so much the details that are included in pornography as the heart and soul of a human relationship that is excluded. In John Reed's 1919 masterpiece on the Russian Revolution, 10 Days That Shook the World, Reed included rich and intricate details, but he constantly connected them to larger forces, which is why almost 80 years later, people still read Reed while they've already forgotten what they read in the paper a few days ago. So at the risk of sounding grandiose, let me briefly lay out my view of our historical context and what the Republicans can learn from it. Western civilization since the fall of Rome can be divided into three overlapping epochs. The rise and domination of a faith-based Christian Europe lasting about a thousand years, the 400-year enlightenment which first honored reason as a counter to faith and superstition and then permitted it to suppress all other human instincts. This enlightenment reached its apotheosis in the centralized, secular, bureaucratized, and technocratic modern state. Phase three was a 50-year reaction against this Baroque stage of enlightenment. Our Republican Revolution is a still modest but significant expression of that infant third epic. At the heart of this historic reaction against the age of reason is the human need for something more than logic and materialism. The modern world has pulverized such traditional institutions as churches and families severing us from our cultural bonds and our spiritual needs. It has created atomized individuals, cities full of strangers with a desperate desire to reconnect with their forebears and their past. In the last half century, we have begun to see that human instinct for community and tradition assert itself. The corresponding reactions to the tyranny of materialism are diverse, but abundant. They include the 1960s rejection of 1950s corporate hegemony, Environmentalism, which responded to the techno-rationalism of business with a pagan and irrational worship of the soil. Religious fundamentalism, which yearns for the rock of truth in a sea of doubt. Holistic medicine, an alternative and a corrective to the strict mind-body dichotomy of 20th century medicine. And anti-statism, clearly visible in the rise of Thatcherism, Ronald Reagan's attack on big government, the Republican Revolution, and the death of monolithic parties in Canada, Japan, Italy, and the Communist Eastern Bloc. The revolution in the United States has come to be epitomized by the balanced budget struggle of the past two and a half years. The budget you want exemplifies the government you advocate. Republicans want both things smaller and Democrats don't. But this narrow focus on the budget is largely an accident of the legislative process and potentially a mistake of emphasis on the Republicans' part. The coalition that elected us, though supportive of a balanced budget specifically, 
was in general voting passionately against an elitist establishment that presumed to substitute rationalist theories for common sense and popular heritage and has brought our country to the brink of cultural collapse. The schools don't teach. The welfare system promoted poverty until we changed it. The project of integrating blacks and Hispanics into the U.S. has been converted into a government mandate to discriminate against whites and Asians. The criminal justice system protects criminals from justice. While school children rape and kill one another and overdose on drugs, our laws prohibit posting the Ten Commandments on school walls. Step by logical step, we children of the Enlightenment, we masters of reason, have outwitted ourselves. Instinctively, the people are shouting, stop. The voters vented their anger by throwing out the governing parties that brought them this horror. In England, the Labour Party, in America, the Democrats, in Russia, the Communists, in Japan, the Liberal Party, in France, the Socialists. Unfortunately, the former opposition parties, Tories and Republicans, which have been in government for some years, are ineffectually responding to the public's call for a return to sanity. Bogged down with the daily details of government, they have lost sight of their place in history and of how that position should affect their actions. And these shortcomings of the post-Enlightenment forces have opened the door for the able politicians of the ousted parties. In Russia, the Communists are reasserting themselves. In England, Tony Blair and his new Labour Party have surged into office. In France, the Socialists have done likewise. And here in the U.S., Clinton is doing his best to fashion a new Democratic Party to steal the revolution from us Republicans. If he is successful, it will be our own damned fault. The Blairs and Clintons of these parties recognize that voters were rejecting the rhetoric of liberalism. And they have moved to address the emotional needs of these voters which have long been ignored by liberal leaders. It is not by accident that English voters know of Blair's deep religious fervor or that Americans hear how Clinton sang in a Baptist choir. Of course, after decades of hearing otherwise from similar liberal voices, it's hard to believe their current tune is anything more than cynical politics. When Clinton said that the era of big government was over, he may not have meant it, but he certainly meant to say it. With the liberals claiming to embrace free markets and balanced budgets, we conservatives have won half the battle. But if we deliver economic growth in a spiritual desert, we will fail. That's why complaints about the current budget deal are misguided. True, it's not everything we wanted. Purists will note the deficiencies. But as a 30-year veteran of practical politics, I would argue that Newt Gingrich and company got the best deal they could out of master politician Bill Clinton. So how should my beloved Republican revolution reinvigorate itself? Rather than obsessing about the budget, we need to focus on our historic mission of reviving the moral and the cultural health of the nation. For inspiration, my old pals in the House Republican Caucus should go back to the prologue. They should read virtually any of Newt's speeches from 1993 and 1984 and act on them. I remember a particularly fine address Newt delivered to the National PTA in 1986 at the Key Bridge Marriott Hotel which is down the block from the Iwo Jima Memorial across the river from the Lincoln Memorial. Great visual town, Washington. Now the National PTA is hardly a cheerful group of house brows. Newt faced a room full of wizened, bitter, left-wing education bureaucrats. These were the sort of people who could quote to the decimal point, the pay scale for an administrative assistant, but wouldn't have a clue or give a damn about the literacy rate of fourth graders. Newt ambled into this snake pit prepared to say what he believed rather than what he knew the group wanted to hear. In his patented, angry white male style punctuated with lacerating wit, he delivered a poignant critique of public miseducation in America and issued a fierce call for radical change. He brought tears to my eyes and begrudging respect from even that ossified audience. The Republican revolutionaries could profitably spend the second half of 1997 holding hearings around the country on public education in the U.S., which, as every parent knows, is indefensible. It will be Bill Clinton's job to defend it, and he will argue, essentially, that the drunken sailor needs more money, which surely he will spend on his family rather than on a better grade of rum. Having made our case to the public, we could then spend 1998 legislating reform. Afterward, we should deal similarly with race and quotas, crime and punishment, the role of religion in the public square. We should lead an annihilating war against drug peddlers. Newt used to give a great speech on that theme. He has been quiet of late, bunkered down so that his own beaten up image will not distract from the work of the party. But the party can't do its work without him. 
It is time for Newt to initiate a full communications and legislative campaign to bring up the curtain of the revolution's second act. Starting now and for the rest of the decade, the Republican Party should systematically confront these failures of Enlightenment liberalism with extensive public scrutiny, followed by a season of legislation. The instinct of the ages is with us. We have only to awaken from our lethargy to end these days that the locusts have consumed. I can't think of a better article to have read today. It's no secret that we as a country have lost our moral ground. And with that, I have no other comments because Mr. Blankley has said it perfectly. That does it for this episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and I will see you next time. Of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided. I mean, actually taking a cue from from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly, the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process. And while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.